Well, we got a lot of fun here tonight. 18189, 2018-2019 action plan. Don't sound too excited, yeah. <laughs> Girl Scouts got tired of waiting because they knew we were talking negotiations and they weren't going to negotiate. Anastasia Wyatt, you're up. Good evening, Mayor, members of council. So the annual action plan that we submit to HUD, I have some great news tonight, finally. <laughs> so we, we received our allocation this afternoon and our final allocation provided us an additional 443,292,000 dollars from the federal government. So in home, we received another $247,197, and in CDBG, $196,095. And in ESG funding, we received a slight uh, decrease in funding of $23,49, but that will be offset, hopefully, by our state ESG funding. In addition, last year we received an additional 277,000 in ESG that was just this magical pot for one year and I don't know why we got it. We were able to fund the homeless shelter, warming shelter this past year with that additional funding. So as we move forward, that funding is not there. So that federal funding gave us more flexibility. So keep that in mind as we move through the budget. What I'm going to show you tonight is the original allocations based on our past subcommittee meeting just last week. So I'm going to quickly run through the original allocations and please be reminded that we just received additional funding. We, we reworked the budget based on the ranking and rating system that we have in place so that it's fair and we're allocating resources as promised, the mid-pen budget is going to look a little funny to you because uh, we wanted to utilize as much home funding for that project because it gives us more flexibility and it is a more uh, sound use of the, the federal funding to utilize it under the home program versus the CDBG program. So currently we, we as an entitlement community, and there is one more little twist to this action plan, what, I, uh, what, we have, what we have typically done in the past since we had the ESG state funding is program all of the state with our federal programming. But this year, the state just two weeks ago said, we're gonna pull back on the notice of funding availability and we're going to do it in three installments. We expect to receive about $887,000 from the state, and that state funding is for both San Benito and Monterey counties. So in addition, we expect to see SB2 funding coming through one of those notice of funding availabilities in the near future. So it does make it a little difficult for us to do some long range planning when we're gonna have three different allocations that we're going to have to respond to, plus go through a pretty extensive process to program the funds. So we did follow our citizen participation plan, which is required by the federal government to program these funds. We allow public input both at this council meeting and in two weeks we'll have another uh, round to explain the final funding allocations. And then we will submit the action plan to the federal government through our HUD office in San Francisco. We did our public hearing notice in El Sol and uh, in the Californian on March 24th and April 14th. The draft action plan are available to the community to view at our offices at the libraries and at City Hall. So the funding overview, like I said, this is just changed today. The original funding requests here, we had program administration. We are capped at 20% for that. So we do take the full 20% of program administration. We have activity delivery, which is an additional fee that we are allowed to charge onto direct administration of projects, such as completing an environmental review. We have a rehab program we recommended for funding of $50,000. Typically our rehab program has been about half a million dollars, but because of the constraints on the budget and the need for funding for mid Penn's Moongate Plaza project, as well as the Community Recreation Center at Sherwood Hall, we really pulled down the budget for 
our housing rehab to accommodate those two projects. Mid Peninsula of the Farm Moongate Plaza, that is the 90 unit development in Chinatown on Soledad Street. The Sherwood Rec Recreation Center we recommended for funding and uh, Grid Alternatives who provides solar, uh, solar panels to house to individual homeowners to reduce their overall costs. Another, other programs that were not funded here were Downtown Streets Team, MST had a request, Salinas Powell, the First United Methodist Church, Door to Hope, and the total ask was 3290000 and we received a little over $2 million. Under the public service funding, which we have a 15% cap, we did the rating and ranking system for this uh, scoring, and the top was Girl Scouts. Uh, next came in with Boys and Girls Club of Monterey County, Partners for Peace, Alliance on Aging, Girls Inc., the Food Bank, Eden Council for uh, Housing and Opportunity, who does our fair housing. And then here's the, the list of what came after that that we didn't have the funding for before. So under that 15% cap, because the amount the federal government gave us today will increase, we will be able to fund slightly more in the public service category. And I will show you what what we are recommending for programming in, in a minute. Here are additional requests. And again, the request was much higher than the funding available, so the total request was 654950 Under home, we promised last fis under our last fiscal year, our action planning process, that all of the home funds minus program administration and program delivery would go into the Moongate Plaza project. Chispa did come in for a request for additional funding for Vista de la Terraza. And Parkside is on the horizon for Monterey County Housing Authority. And we, we have met with all of our housing developers to make sure that we're keeping their timelines and with our funding timelines as well. Under ESG, we started this process out thinking we're programming all of the San Benito, Monterey County, plus our funding. We had a priority that the, the shelters would be funded above, above anything else because that is the priority for both San Benito and for, for the city of Salinas and Monterey County. So under the rating and ranking system, again, that was utilized to come up with these recommendations. McComb came in at the top, so they, they were the first to be funded. We had uh, another community human services come in at a high ranking that we're not recommending for funding tonight because we, we again prioritized the shelter. So these are the new um, funding recommendations, and I apologize that it's uh, so small. So I'm sorry, uh, Francisco, may we approach the dice and give you guys the, the handout? Sure. We'll, we'll make sure you can see it. Francisco, help me out. And I apologize. Again, this happened late in the afternoon, and we scrambled to make sure that it was prepared for you tonight. to point out under CDBG first, you have home, you have CDBG, and you have ESG funding recommendations. So I will start with CDBG, and I'm going to start with housing, public facilities, and economic development. Mid-Pen, it looks as though, so there is a staff recommendation, and you can see the, the original staff recommendation as of prior to this afternoon. The staff recommendation and the subcommittee recommendation. So please look at this column for staff recommendation. We were able to, we believe that we're going to leave the, and, it, and this is ultimately um, just what we were able to come up with today. Housing rehab, we, we left it at the level that was at the subcommittee. 
Moongate Plaza looks decreased, but as I uh, let you know before, we increased the home allocation so that we are fulfilling our promise to TCAC, to the developer, and to you, City Council. Grid alternatives has been left at level funding, and the subcommittee recommendation was 600,000. The original staff recommendation was 600,000. And I do fear that we will not be able to open the pool unless we bump up that budget. So we were, the recommendation is to bump the budget to 929,000. For home funds, please pull out your home fund Again, this was pretty simple, straightforward. Moongate Plaza received the full allocation minus program delivery and staff admin. Under the, sorry, I skipped around. Under CDBG Public Services, the request at subcommittee last week was that if additional funding did come in, that we would go down the list to the next highest ranking application. We looked, and legal services for seniors, we had a minimum allocation of 25,000. This is the first year we've implemented that. They did have a full request of 25,000, and we are recommending that uh, we fully fund both applications to the 25,000, although they're in two separate, uh, cat or on the list, and that we would be able to increase the allocation uh, for the food bank to 132,850. This allows us a little more, one more application that is funded and funding the food bank at a higher level. For ESG, we were we had to pull back, as I said, we had a slight decrease, $2,000, $2,349 less. And again, the priority was the top application, McComb, program ad administration in ESG, we get the lowest amount of program administration of 7.5% on the federal side. The state side, we get about 2.3% for our administration. And we also, funded, are recommending funding for the warming shelter. Now you will see that street outreach and emergency shelter was the biggest request from all of our, our grantees and we are limited to 60% of an allocation toward those two activities. We have been recommending to the grantees that they apply for rapid rehousing funding so that we have a better chance of not going through the 60% cap and we can fund more, getting more people housed. So on the 40% side, we have homeless pre prevention, rapid rehousing, and HMIS. And under that, we had to fund Cecil because they're coming, although they scored lower, they're the only ones who fit the 40% category and do the rapid rehousing. In addition, the First United Methodist Church had a, a total ask of, I believe it was about, here it is, 100 and, uh, it, it, this is inaccurate right here, sorry, it's about $100,000. And we're only able to fund this HMIS portion of their ask, which is $7,000 for the homeless management information system. One goal we have is because they are uh, one of, they see some of the most homeless daily within the community that we have cross uh, counting and HUD requires that there's third party documentation on homeless uh, accounting. Who, so who, who is who's out there on the streets? We have to prove to HUD through third party documentation that the chronically homeless are actually chronically homeless and those that are homeless are actually homeless. Without that third party documentation, 
we can lose ESG funding for the whole community and for the counties. So we are required to, we, we did receive a finding on that actually in an audit two years ago. So that is something that we're trying to build up and it's not just for us, it's for the entire continuum of care who we work with on all of our ESG program programming. So those are our recommendations at this time. We will come back in two weeks and try to make final recommendations. So we wanted to make sure you were aware of the full, uh, what happened today, and give you the best recommendations that we could give you in this short notice. But for us, we, we had some program. We knew this was probably going to happen, and we, we were uh, accommodating for that. Thank you. We'll now go to council members for questions. There is no action on this item. The action will be taken on May the 15th. Councilwoman Craig. Uh, is the CDBG subcommittee meeting again to discuss the new recommendations? Yes. Good. I don't have any other further questions. Thank you. Oh, Council member McShane, any questions? Sure. Um, how, did you, how do you credit the additional allocation for the food bank? So the food bank requested $150,000. Mm -hmm. We had we felt we need to uh, fund fair housing, which came below them on the rating and ranking. So we split the original uh, recommendation between fair housing and the food bank and that 15% cap that we have. Yep. And so the original recommendation was 99,850 to the food bank. Yep. With these additional funds, that 15% increases, we're able to fund uh, legal services for seniors, two applications, which really we see it as one application. Yeah. And then whatever was left over, we put it into the food bank because they were the next highest yep. application. Cool. Um, okay. Uh, are we doing a two-year cycle? Yes. This is the first year okay. of a two-year cycle. Thank you for pointing that out. Yes. Uh, and ultimately, we're giving out more money to less agencies. We... Um, we that's good. Okay. Um, and then how are you set up to do internal audits and keep up with inspections and documentation and all of that? That's a good question. One of the reasons that this 25000 minimum came into play is we are administering more grants now. We're administering the state funding for two counties with the same staff. Right. And so we end with... Uh, what we know in program administration of federal funds that it doesn't matter if it's $1,000 or $100,000 when you're looking at public services, they're all as equally staff intensive, they're as intensive on the administration side for both the city of Salinas and for the nonprofit. And there, there have been some studies done as to what should the minimum allocation be so that there's a real net benefit yeah. And that that is about ten thousand dollars. So if we're pretty much breaking even on the administration side, then you know we need to really increase that so that we do see a benefit yeah. from the public services. And in addition, we are trying to coordinate services and make sure that there is an impact with the funding that is is coming through the city and out into the community. Okay. Um, the committee meetings, just because this came to my attention, uh, do you notice them? Are they held in a closet, uh, out of the public? Um, you know, to what extent are you doing outreach? Are they recorded, um, and are the meetings available via audio or YouTube? But there's, there's been questions that have come to my attention on that. Okay, so we follow, meetings. we follow, um, our subcommittee meeting rules just as other, all other subcommittees within the city. Mm -hmm. So we do post as we're required and we do take minutes 
and we do publish those minutes, and we do uh, have the committee approve those minutes at every meeting. The meetings are public. Anyone is welcome to come to those meetings. Cool. And if there's interested parties, do you go out of your way to shoot the agenda out to those people that sign up to, to be on that list, so to speak? Yes, we update our RFP list, which is what we call it, um, okay. annually and regularly and as people request information. So people's emails are on there, they'll know that there's a meeting, okay. Right, and some have requested that we send the information, we've been doing that this, this fiscal year. Uh, now's as good a time as any, just because I think it's of interest to the public. Uh, do you know the status of last year? I think it were last cycle's allocation to the First United Methodist Church uh, for the kitchen repairs? I believe it was $500,000. Do you know the status of it? Um, I don't think it's been allocated, right? The funding is was released by HUD about a month ago. We received our authority to use grant funding, and that is HUD's had reviewed our our NEPA review, which is the National Environmental Policy Act, uh, similar to the California Environmental Quality Act, but it's on at the federal level. So we the HUD approved the funding through that, and they also programmatically reviewed the funding to the Methodist Church. Um, to the application since there's been a lot of scrutiny and questioning at the city level. And they came back with a recommendation that everything in this application is ready to go. So what's the status? So the status right now is we are looking at the project and hopefully we will release a request for proposals for architecture at some point soon. Thanks, that's all. Questions, Councilwoman De La Rosa. Thank you for the <laughs> report. Anastasia, just for the public, um, how important is it that you know we're funding our our housing um, and interim? What does that mean to the public? What kind of residents so do we have an interim and, and why is it so important to move forward with the mid pen project? who, what residents are gonna be housed there, just so that the public knows how important all this is. Right, and, and a lot of what we wanna do with, sorry, do you? Do no, and then one, one last question quickly. How were, how were the, um, how was everyone ranked? How, how did you rank these um, public service um, agencies? Okay. Just quickly. Sure. So the public service agencies were ranked by staff, and we had a couple of other people that came in and assisted us with the rating and ranking. Uh, and they, it was based on the merits of the application. W was the application eligible under CDBG? What would the impact be within the community? We have priority areas such as uh, the, the neighborhood strategy area in the LSL and Chinatown. Those are kind of our, our core areas where we're really trying to bring the community up and provide more funding and services to help the most lowest income in the community, which is the point of these federal funds is that we're really addressing the needs of the low income community within our community and making sure they have the same ask, same opportunities as, as other members of our community. So uh, that those are the main ways that we rated and ranked. When it comes to the ESG funding, we are required to work with the coalition of homeless service providers and we also worked with the county because this coordination of services for emergency solutions grant funding is something uh, nationwide people are starting to see that we have all the, we have billions of dollars of funding going out and we still have such a huge homeless situation. Why is that happening? We need to start coordinating our resources and that's why we coordinate with the coalition of homeless service providers and the county so that we know what we're funding and what levels and what is needed and that we have the impact of getting people off the streets and into housing. Wow. Yeah. Questions, Councilor Rivera? Ms. Wyatt, I heard this from a couple of nonprofits where uh, I know I just heard that you're giving more money to less agencies. But, but I've heard from a couple of agencies that even if you give them $5,000 from CDBG, that it gives them access to be able to go out and solicit funding from other grant sources. 
Is that a true statement or? I would, leave, I would leave that up to the nonprofits if, if that's what they're telling you. Okay, so because we are trying to provide service to our community, if that's a true statement, because I have not verified that, you would think CDBG would want to give, even if it's a little bit, but if these nonprofits can really go out and get more funding, I think it would be great for our community. So that, that's just a tidbit information. The other thing is I'm going to throw this out because uh, who's on your uh, CDBG committee? The subcommittee? Uh, uh, the mayor, Gloria De La Rosa, and v Viegas, Councilman Viegas. Uh, so I'm just going to throw it out there. I'm, I'm, I'm known for throwing out premature requests, but it's my understanding that the, at the Firehouse Recreation Center, the second floor cannot be used because they need an elevator. So whatever that means, I'm throwing it out there. We need to look at that because that's a lot of wasted space that either seniors, or young people can use. Uh, so Mr. Corpus, I'm going to ask you for my assistance there. And uh, I'd like to find out what the status is on that. Thank you. Councilmember Davis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a quick question, Anastasia. Um, where you have legal services for seniors, legal ser under public services, and it shows the amount requested is 10,000, but staff's recommending 25,000. Can you explain why they're recommending more than what they're asking? If you look down uh, to, we have a minimum number one of $25,000. And if you look down the list, Meals on Wheels was next at $15,000. And then uh, they have a fair housing component. So the way we, we look at that, and we spoke to them, about this that they just didn't get that $25,000 minimum. Uh, we felt it, we do need fair housing and that is why we reduced the funding, the full request from the food bank is that we really felt we needed to go one step below and fund the legal, the fair housing and tenant landlord with Eden. And we do have a sort of similar situation going on with legal services for seniors with the fair housing built into uh, both the legal services and the fair housing. So we see it as one application. It shouldn't have been split into two. That used to be something that happened uh, prior to a couple years ago. And, and now, you know, we, we fix that, like it should be one application. So we're recommending that they, we spoke to them and of, of course they could use the full $25,000. And so we're recommending to fund them the 25,000 minimum. I, I think I understand what you're saying. Um, and my just point on it was that Mills on Wheels, I think could have, well, obviously they're there, they could benefit from it. It's not an exorbitant amount, but with the minimum 25,000, I don't know if it's illegal for legal services to then redonate money. Probably is because it's a grant, but I'd like to see us try to fund Meals on Wheels a little bit as well. I think it's important for our seniors. I know in my family personally, back with my great great grandma when she was still alive, if it wasn't for Meals on Wheels, she wouldn't eat. So I think it's very important that we, it, it, as much as we can, provide them with some kind of funding. Given the $25,000 minimum, I leave it up to you to figure out how to do that. But that would be my request. Thank you. How many staff members have to go back and monitor all of these funds that go out? So all of my staff monitors, uh, we have one person pretty much dedicated to the public services for ESG and for CDBG. And it because we have taken on this additional administration of the state funding, our administrative burden really has increased a lot. And with three NOFAs being proposed by the state, everything we just did thinking we were going to be ready to go with our application cycle, we're going to have to do this three more times, which is a lot of work. And we don't want to lose the funding of the, the additional $887,000 from the state. And we do need to keep our staff resources in mind when, this, when it comes to administering these, these grants. Thank you. We'll go to the public. Anybody in the public like to comment on this item? Have a seat, Anastasia. 
Kevin Dayton, Government Affairs Director of the Salina City Center Improvement Association. This item is listed on the agenda as FY 2018-19 Action Plan Recommendation. Conduct a public hearing to receive comments on the proposed FY 2018-19 Action Plan. I don't think that this is sufficient to tell the public what's going on. Believe it or not, a lot of regular people don't even know what FY means. And then we uh, have the report, staff report in the report, and we hear about CGB, CDBG Home ESG. These all are grants, by the way, that come from HUD. And somehow Mid, MidPen is involved, and of course we've got to track everything with HMIS. This is just not transparent to the public, this sort of thing. And the problem goes down to that CGBG Homeless Subcommittee where often at times agendas weren't even put up discussing what was going on. And as you know, in closed session today, you're gonna to be dealing with some business I would consider unpleasant, regrettable, and grievous. And I think part of the problem was nobody in the regular public is going to understand what any of this stuff is. Unless you're a housing policy expert really into it or somebody with 27 years of public policy experience, these sort of acronyms are gonna go by you. So you're not really going to recognize when something involves public input. There needs to be more transparency. At the very least, change that committee title so it's Community Development Block Grant slash Housing Committee so people have an idea what's going on. It's too insider here. So I would request in the future, I think you can avoid a lot of future policy problems and the business you're dealing with tonight by just making it clear to people what this is all about. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good evening, Mayor and Council members and staff. I had a minute and 59 second um, speech to give, but thank you. And I, I am sorry, I'm Kelly Morgantini from Legal Services for Seniors. And thank you for the reconsideration. I assure the council members and all of the staff and the audience here, the funds that, that you're giving to us are going directly to City of Salinas Seniors. And I'd be happy, uh, Councilman Davis, to talk with you later about what we specifically do. Uh, uh, we've, been, we've worked with the staff what, quite closely in the last couple of years, actually the last couple of months. And I just want, I'm thankful for the funds we received in the past and what we're being recommended for again tonight. And that we admire all of your hard work. We're really, we're really happy for it. I know that these are hard deliberations and hard considerations to make uh, for, for everybody. There's a lot of nonprofits that are funded. They all do extremely well uh, deserved and, and needed jobs. And so I would like to just state if anybody has any extra questions from you or from the public on legal services, I'm happy to uh, talk with you about them. Thank you. I know we'll be looking at this. And, and just so Melissa and Anastasia know, I see uh, some new CDBG timesheets in our future. So thank you very much. Thank you for your hard work. And make sure you, you feel any better. I know you, I'm going, I have to leave, but I'm going to another meeting. So you might get out earlier than the next meeting I have to go to. So good luck with all of that. Thank you. Not likely, but maybe. <laughs> Mayor, council members, my name is Vanessa Brea, and I'm the program manager, and on behalf of Partners for Peace, we would like to thank you for giving us the opportunity to bring our Parent Project Loving Solutions program um, to the Salina specifically in the 93905 area. So we've had, we deliver our preventative education program to over 150 families um, since the end of the 2016 year till now. We have served 150 of those families who have reported that they have better communication, their children are doing better in school, and they see less negative behaviors in their children. And out of those families that have completed the program, three of them have gone on to be paid facilitators for us. So thank you for all your hard work. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the City Council, uh, Cesar Lara. Just wanted to spend some time and actually praise uh, the, the staff and the council. Um, I encourage the community to come to a subcommittee or, or get a little bit deeper. It is complicated with acronyms, but there's a lot of work being done with a small amount of money. 
Um, this is an opportunity where the federal government gives to cities to make uh, these decisions that are tough. But I'm always surprised with how much impact this very little amount of money does with the many services that are being done. And I'm always impressed by it and also understand how administratively hard it is to administer federal grants, having been a congressional aide at one time, uh, having seen the other end of it. Uh, anytime you spend federal money, it's so costly to spend the money that is given to you. Uh, and so um, I en encourage the, the staff to work really hard and uh, send the message to the public to encourage their congressman like Jimmy Panetta to try and get us more money because this is very impactful work and it's really salt of the earth work that's being done in the community. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Cindy Stores. I am the program manager for the Neighborhood Services Center at the First United Methodist Church. And if you're in support of, uh, then why don't you just stand up, all you nice United Methodist folks who are. Some of these folks are going to probably want to come up here, but we wanted to save um, two minutes times all that. I spent the day um, in HMIS training, and as I learned about that whole process of um, putting folks on a registry and allowing them to have access to housing, I could think of easily 20, 30 people that we serve every day who have no idea that they're eligible to be um, inventoried, to, be, um, to have their information put into the HMIS database for housing. And so I'm really grateful, Anastasia, for your staff and the work that they're doing and the possibility that the people that we serve, somewhere between 100 and 150 folks, um, have the possibility of being housed. Thank you. My name is uh, Hati Nai. I'm one of the lay leader of First United Methodist Church. This is 22 years I'm being member on that church. And uh, it's a uh, blessed for me to be here. And uh, for those that not stop on every third Sunday, we have barbecue for everyone. It's not for the homeless. And welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Barbara Muck. I'm a member of Sacred Heart Church, uh, but also uh, coordinator of the uh, clothes closet at the United Methodist Church, which is an integral part of the services there. Uh, I would like to thank all of you that journeyed down to see uh, the services that we offer to our homeless population, many of them who are my friends from the streets, Soledad Street in Chinatown for many years, so that's kind of dating me a little bit, but I'm still out there being a part of that population to help them out. Uh, on a personal note, people want to know about how you called to do this. Uh, it goes back way back in my personal life. I was uh, put up for adoption right after I was born. So I was in the system for five years. I know what it's like to be a victim of verbal abuse, physical abuse, and sexual abuse. So maybe that's why I can relate to many of the walking wounded in our town. But I want to thank all of you for being present and helping us. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council people. Allow me to adjust my fun meter from max to minimum. Uh, this is not much fun uh, <laughs> appearing here, but uh, I'm here to share with you, as I'm sure you, you already know, there at First United Methodist Church, we serve food six days a week, 
but it's food disguised as love. We, I, I want to thank you for your interest in our program, and I want to urge your continued support of our program, for without the program, we would have to discontinue our services, and the problems that are faced in the center part of our city would be exasperated many, many fold. So we hope that we, what we are doing will mitigate many problems that are happening in our city. Thank you very, very much for your support. Thank you. Walk right up there, young lady. You're next. Hello. Arlen Strong, uh, community member and a uh, member of the home, uh, disenfranchised community. Can't hear, um, can't hear me. Microphone. All right. What do you want me to do with it? There you, go. you got me? Much All right. Thank you. I am Arlen Strong, a member of our uh, marginalized, disenfranchised community. I would ask, please, um, if we make a gentle adjustment in our wording, this is a simple one. Instead of saying homeless, which has such a bad connotation to it, why not change it? And come on, guys, we went to school. To uh, disenfranchised, marginalized. In other words, homeless has got so much baggage now. It, it, it's, a, it's a simple thing, really. It will take a little bit of thought. But if we sort of phase that word out, make one of those one of the words that we don't say, maybe it will change someone's ideas we won't get, but they won't get the pictures that the word homeless gives. Just a thought, a gentle one. Maybe we should change our wording as well. And thank you for listening. By the way, what he said, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for all of you coming. And I greatly appreciate this time that I can share. Um, I want to say that, that the Methodist Church has been wonderful. Not only are they a great working team, the food is excellent. For a group of people, it's amazing. And they give you two proteins and two vegetables and dessert. And so it's been outstanding. Many of the people there are homeless, yes, but again, uh, others are there for medical reasons. In other words, um, maybe they've had a stroke. Now they're mu much better, or they're no longer in a wheelchair, but they need a hot lunch every day, and they do breakfast for the nut people that are up early. My daughter and I have lunch each um, day that it's workable. My daughter has two disabilities and we rented a room and um, they said no kitchen privileges. Okay, we'll use the microwave. Then they said, no, you cannot use the microwave in your room. That's it. So the meals have become our lifeline. She gets her hot food and a variety, and I go with her to give company. The um, situation that you have with the people, many, many friends, and they're hungry for friendship and come to um, relate to each other and the good food. Another thought that I uh, want to share, they have a resource uh, team, and that's Thank CCL you, Your time is up. and Age of Lim just numerous ones floating in the group. Her time is up. And seeing um, if they can help somebody. And again, your right. time is up. Again, thank you. Remember, a one bedroom place is 1,300 plus deposit. Two bedrooms, 1,800 plus three times the rent. Thank you. <laughs> Good 
Good evening, my name is Diane Guerin. I volunteer at the church um, one day a week feeding not just the homeless, as these ladies have said, but we have families with children, we have people that are mentally ill people, adults that they have to choose at the end of the month whether they're gonna eat or take their medication. So this isn't just homeless people, which even if it was, it's an amazing program. It gives me joy and it's, we, we need more joy in our city. I mean, everybody's sitting here, oh my gosh, this is boring, or this is, you know, depressing, or this is something joyful that we can do. And yes, it's not perfect, but what is perfect? Nothing. And we still go on with things. You go to a restaurant and have a lousy meal, you go back. We have Fourth of July, and we have people shooting off illegal uh, um, fireworks. We still do it. Yes, we have problems. But it's so much better. There's more good that happens at that Methodist church. And it's not just feeding like they say. It's, it's sharing love. It's sharing friendship. It's teaching these people to give back to their community. It's showing them, like Pastor Cindy said, they can get housing. It's showing them how to go out and, and better themselves and get jobs. It is not just one thing. And it, it, the city just needs more joy and it just needs to back this program and wish there were more programs like it. So I just thank you for considering it. My name is Bill Ely. I've been a, a volunteer and member of the First United Church since um, the 12th. 2012, and I was not apologizing and everything before that, but I joined the church, became a volunteer, and they helped me get my, every pile of my IDs. You know, I got a home now. I got, um, they just helped me out a whole bunch. It's not just food. There's food, too, but it's there for anybody who wants it. Go down there and get helped out. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, point of order, um, if I may. It, th we are currently discussing the funding mechanisms for CDBG, and I would just caution uh, that if we're talking about any other item on the agenda, that, um, that we address it at that time. Otherwise, if somebody is speaking to one particular grant uh, funding mechanism for one particular nonprofit, I would think that that would be more appropriate for this time. Thank you. Just clarifying that they're speaking to that $7,000 and not other items on the agenda. Uh, Mayor, I think we're wasting more time. Let them speak and it'll be over, but we're wasting more time over here with point of clarification. Council members, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. My name is Richard Garza. My wife and I have recently started attending uh, First United Methodist Church. And the thing that attracted us to the church was its programs. What is its community outreach? And I think that, uh, and I'm, I, I'm at first, I was, when I first heard about it, I was amazed that government and the church were working together to accomplish something. And that it's an ongoing relationship. And I, I think that's incredibly important, especially in this time when funding for social services and community programs keeps diminishing to, to, to draw on those two resources. So I strongly encourage you to keep it going because it is important. It, um, and having worked in government for 30 years, not something I've seen happen a whole lot. So I commend you. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm very happy to, to be working with the church and to be attending the church because they are doing what needs to be done and what they're called to do. And that's a great combination. When need, when need and, and commitment come together, you can really accomplish a lot. Thank you. Mayor, City Council. I'm Steve Lundeen, pastor of First United Methodist Church. 
and um, this morning between 6 a.m. and about 1, I estimate that our toilets were flushed between four and 500 times. Think about that. We, you know, we hear a lot of, I, I can't quite figure out this fixation on the Methodist Church for causing the prom, problems of homelessness in Salinas. We are simply uh, a fairly small church trying to respond to human need in the community. And this is religious work. People say stick to religion, stick to inspiration. This is inspiration. I've never worked at a church like this. This is a group of people putting their faith into action every day. About this time last year, you uh, granted us uh, a generous grant for the uh, for, to redo, to rehab our kitchen. And I was grateful for that, and I continue to be grateful. And I know that I have your continued support. We want to get this thing done. As Anastasia said, um, HUD has ruled. It's time to move forward. And uh, thank you. Thank you. I was already nervous when I walked up here the first time, and then I was cut short. But anyway, um, the Methodist. Had, uh, I've been homeless. I lived in a tent. I lived on the streets. And if it wasn't for the Methodists, I don't know where I'd be right now. Um, they've been there for me for the last seven years in different capacities. And there's other people that um, they're there for now. And when I, when I become homeless, I see a lot of the same people. And either with, they're caught you know, up in their addiction or they got mental illnesses. And uh, the church tries to do whatever they can. We're implementing, implementing programs now to, uh, to help, help out people. Um, and, and I was never homeless. Um, and, and then I become homeless uh, seven years ago because of my addiction and my mental illness. And I got many addictions. But I'm fighting to it. And if it wasn't for them and the different programs that I can go to, I, uh, I, I don't know where I'd be right now. I'd probably still be strung out on the streets. And, uh, and I got a little time under me right now. So I, I you know, the funding that they get is, is very appreciative. And thank you for listening to me. Thank you. We'll now close public comment on this item. We take it back to council for any final comments. There is no action on this. We'll come back on May the 15th. Councilmember McShane. Yeah, the $7,000 allocation allows public surface of pretty challenging situation in District 3. I'd say it's the most challenging. If it's not the food bank or the Fox Theater or contracts with the fire department, I would say that the ongoing homelessness downtown is at the top. Uh, I'll point out that the 7,000 has the support of the property-based organization, SCCIA, the Property-Based Improvement Association, and those from the First United Methodist Church. It's a good example of the two organizations working together. But I would say that the point consistently comes up that the activities at the homeless, uh, the Neighborhood Services Center are far and above and beyond what most people would expect from a church. Um, certainly the activities 10, 20 years ago, for those that have been attending the church for decades, uh, the nature and the, the activities have changed. Now there's a lot of fingers that you can point. Why, how bad is the problem? Is the city doing its job? Is the county doing its job? Why are we here? You know, at the end of the day, we as a community need to figure out how we're gonna make downtown work and work together. Uh, and I don't know if that's possible, um, but I'm certainly committed to addressing it. Uh, the challenge is this. 
the activities of the church have grown, the nature of those activities have changed. And in my conversations, numerous, with the pastor, uh, I would propose that those activities don't always have to occur at that church's location. Uh, there's pushback from neighbors, residents, businesses, property owners, uh, that it's really becoming burdensome. Now, that's not necessarily correct homelessness, outsource everything, move it to somebody else's town. We're talking about people that are very, very sensitive and want to be part of that solution. Uh, but ultimately, you know, tonight, in the coming weeks, in the coming months, this city, the Downtown Property-Based Improvement Association, the church, and everybody else needs to work on a solution that, that the community can bear. Um, and I guess I just, I put that out there because there's been letters, there's been emails, there's been visits, but I think this is the first time publicly that we've been able to just surface that challenge. And it's great, it's grave, there's blood on the streets. Uh, and sure, homelessness is a huge challenge. This council, this city, and the county of Monterey are committed to working towards a solution. Uh, but specific to the church and the activities that have grown greatly in the last 10 years, uh, we need to do something immediately before property values drop and you know the threat to our downtown vibrancy, the hundreds of thousands of dollars that the city has also prioritized towards growing a vibrant downtown are just thrown out the window. Uh, so to each of the speakers today, as challenging as this can be, literally a dagger in your heart and in your faith and in a calling that's deeper than some people can really appreciate, I invite you to find deeper patience uh, to extend that conversation and see what, what, what can happen. Uh, my, my recent conversations with Pastor Lundeen uh, is that the activities are so great, the funding, the, the growth is so great that you could take the brand Countywide, uh, you know, who's to say that you have to be limited to the facility that you're at now? Um, so I, I implore that that creativity. Uh, back to the topic at hand. There's a couple things I would say about these allocations. As I say every year, they're data driven. Thank God. Thank God, as it was 10 years ago, we're not here <laughs> hustling deals for dollars between the nonprofit that squawks the greatest. Thank you for maintaining a data-driven selection process. Thank you for moving towards a two-year cycle. And thank you for moving towards greater allocations that are fewer in number, making it easier to police and self-audit those awards. So, you know, to that tune, um, I'm happy to, to support it. I know it's not the opportunity to vote. Um, and we'll just continue to see how we can all work together. That's all. Councilmember Villegas, any comments on this item? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think everyone up here and in the audience sees that the work that the church does. Um, my main concern is the government getting involved and then looking like they favor one religion over another. Um, I don't believe it's the government's business to get into the charity. I think it's private enterprise. Um, private funds should be used for those things. But... Um, I know there is a need out there because of the situation with the housing that we've policy makers in the past have created. Um, and that's the, those are the cards we're, we're dealt and going forward, we have to look at alternatives. Hopefully they're temporary. And I've said it before, I hope that every um, Dorothy's Kitchen, those types of um, places go out of business because that means that we have good policies that are increasing the amount of opportunities for people to, and the housing is low enough to where they can go into those, um, where those services are per, um, provided, where people are not in the streets. Um, my main concern is, you know, we provide a bunch of services, but what is the, is it more is it more moral to just give a person a meal and help them out for that particular time? Or is it more immoral to not help them at all? I mean, that's, that's a philosophical question. But I think that if 
any entity that receives government money has some sort of action plan to where it helps people get off the street, give them a hand up, as um, as has been pointed out by a couple council members up here today, then that's where we want to go. We just don't want to have a continual legacy and just make the problem even bigger. Um, we want to reduce these things. We want to see people getting off the street. We want to see them getting the help they need. Um, but I think that we have to be very careful as far as the uh, government body, um, you know, doling out money to certain programs of certain religions because we don't want it to look like we're favoring one over the other. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilwoman Craig. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I would have preferred, I, I know the, the intent of staff was to get the new funding uh, resources to us today for the presentation. I would have preferred um, staff recommendations go to that subcommittee first prior to coming back to council. Um, it, puts, it puts the subcommittee and the council in a little bit of an awkward position now that staff has recommended new uh, funding sources for certain nonprofits and allows for very little dialogue or, or change. Um, now that it's been publicly presented. So um, just from the, from the perspective of having the original staff recommendation and then going to subcommittee, that's where staff would get council feedback from two or three council members to then bring it to the full board. Um, and in this case, those recommendations got shifted prior to being presented today. So, you know, I would just... Uh, make the request that subcommittee meets one more time and goes over those um, staff recommendations prior to it coming back to council. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Davis, comments? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think it's somewhat ideological to think that, at least in the here and now, that homelessness is going to go away. And I agree with what was said earlier about labeling homelessness. And I think when we label people, it makes it easier to um, it makes it easier to dehumanize them. Um, we live in the reality that we live in. Uh, one day uh, in Nirvana, it would be great to have no homelessness and robots fixing robots and nobody would ever have to work and we'd have unlimited supplies of everything. But that's not the reality that we live in, nor is it in at least my foreseeable future. Um, I like what, what you're doing, Anastasia. Keep up the good work. Um, there's, there's a lot of contention amongst uh, groups uh, in the um, McShane's district, and I thank God that it's not in District 1, because that's a lot for you to have to work with Steve. And what Steve has to juggle, I mean, my hat is off to him. He's juggling SCCIA with the church, and uh, I, I don't know if I would want to be put into that position that you're in, having to pick between business and a religion, basically. And the, the people in this room have a very strong belief in what they're doing, and uh, uh, they're calling on what they're doing. And so I have to respect that as a council member and as a member of this community, that we have good people out here who are doing good things for other people. Um, I would like to see, like Councilmember McShane said, a way that SCCIA and the Methodist Church could work together so that we can serve the needs of the community in a way that's mutually beneficial. And I think it's possible. But to this, Anastasia, thank you for, for doing the work that you do. This is somewhat complicated, uh, difficult to read, I, I agree. But it's much needed, and we have the funding that's out there. It's great that we're able to get it into this community because we can use the money. Thank you. Councilmember Barrera. Thank you, Mayor. I guess in biblical terms, if you bring it to government, we're going to have to cut the baby in half. <laughs> you know, one of the things that these issues should not be coming to this body, but it comes to this body because there's no harmony in our community. I don't believe it's a district issue. It's a citywide issue. I know people personally that, I won't use the word that you said not to use, but there are people that are ha having difficulties financially and they will not go to Chinatown because they're afraid. So they go out somewhere else where they continue to be afraid and they hide among the bushes or, or, or wherever. We're going through that in the city. 
I think to the business community in downtown and pastor to your, your flock here, one of your greatest allies is that woman that's right there in front of us. If you can resolve these issues on your own out there, don't bring them to this body. Uh, hold on, ma'am. So I, I, I've heard, and again, that the church doesn't talk to the business association. The business association doesn't talk to the church. So, that, I mean, that's your business. If you bring it here, you're not going to like what we're going to do. But if you bring it here, we're going to have to make a decision. If you're a business owner and you're not a business owner, you don't know what a business owner goes through. Can you imagine having a person in front of their their storefront, regardless of their situation? It creates problems for them because the customers are afraid to come into their storefront. And they have overhead. The property owner, or there's a lot of factors here. And everybody has an interest. But I think what's important is, is, is that you deal miss, with Ms. Wyatt and bring a solution to it. You know, we're, we're going to have people, financial, I think even your Bible says you're going to have the poor always. Those issues, I mean, they're way out of our control. And I'm going to finish with this. I know people out on the streets that have family members here, but they burn their bridges within their own families. They create problems in their own home. But we heard miracles today. There's a gentleman that was homeless, and now he's got a place to live. See, see how awesome is that? If we can multiply that, that's great. Pastor, I, I challenge you to figure out a solution how to work with the business owners, the property owners. But you got to think like them. And they got to figure out a way how to think like you because you have a calling. And you got to stick to that calling. But as long as you continue to fight, you're going to bring it here, and your issue is not going to get solved. But so hopefully we'll find solutions. And Mr. Ms. Uh, Wyatt, congratulations on on your work. There's a lot of agencies that are providing good services. So thank you for that. Councilwoman De La Rosa. Being the last one. Um, uh, it's about unity, finding the solution. It's about compassion. And I know that every single one of you in this room has compassion. And um, yeah, uh, the Methodist Church has grown in giving more services because more of our residents, and I call them residents, are going there because there is a difference for some of you that are sitting there between the residents that are living right now in Chinatown and the residents that go to the Methodist Church. There, I hear, yeah, there, there's differences there. Why they wanna go over here and why they would stay over here. Um, and some of them are, are, are psychosocial stuff. So again, um, I, I'm just, I believe in prayer, and I really am praying about this, that we, as a community, that we show the rest of the, the, the other cities that Salinas can come together and collaborate on such an important issue as the Methodist Church and the services that they're providing, and how can we work with the businesses. All right, I'm going to try to bring it back a little bit back on track. This was, and this is for Mr. Dayton. This is the fiscal year 2018-2019 report on our uh, funding for ESG, HUD, and the other things. We will have another subcommittee meeting. We will post it. We'll get the information out, and we'll discuss the grants of the money that became available that we were unaware of until like an hour before this meeting. So, and I appreciate. Councilwoman Craig, but this gives uh, everybody an opportunity to see what's coming forward. And there'll be further discussion about the Methodist Church later. So thank you very much. And now we're ready for one more item. Now the fun begins. <laughs>